Welcome to this special edition of the podcast, My Extraordinary Family. And I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to be meeting today with Gavin Collins, who is to be the next Bishop of Dorchester. And we're talking just a few minutes after his announcement has been uh, made public from Dorchester Abbey, where he is now. And Gavin, it's really lovely to meet with you in this way. And welcome to the team. It's great to have you aboard. Uh, Thank you, Bishop Stephen. It's great to be coming on board. Thank you. Uh, and uh, one of the things I, I've been fascinated to learn about you uh, in the things I've read and what you've told me is that earlier this year, you cycled from Land's End to John O'Groats. That sounds extraordinary. Uh, I, I've done well to take up a bit of jogging this summer. So tell us how that came about. How was it? Well, it, it sort of came about by accident, really. I've, I've always been a keen cyclist, but this year when um, summer holidays abroad weren't going to be in prospect because of the coronavirus, a conversation with my 18-year-old son, as he was then, um, now turned nine, 19, Harry, um, we thought, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Why don't we do it? So Harry and I um, did it, Christina, my wife, um, driving a camper van to support us as we camped at various campsites along the way. It was great fun. I'm not sure it was the wisest decision in the world to try and do it with an 18-year-old. He set a very cracking pace up some of the hills, but was very good at being patient and waiting for me to catch up. But it it was a tremendous achievement, um, but a one-off. I won't be doing it again. It's not something you plan to repeat regularly uh, uh, across the diocese. No, but I look forward to cycling around Oxfordshire. Oh, fantastic. And and you're living currently uh, in Hampshire, near Portsmouth, where you're an archdeacon. What, what are you looking forward to about this move for you and for the family? Uh, the, the new challenge is getting to know new communities, churches across Oxfordshire. Um, I, I've loved my ministry, my current ministry as an archdeacon. Having had parish ministry before that, uh, which was a wonderful joy and a privilege, I've, re- I've relished um, the opportunity to support a number of churches across um, my archdeacon area. And so to take that now to the next stage, um, in Oxfordshire, in the new role as bishop, um, to work with the churches, the clergy, the lay members, and our wider communities um, in sharing the love of God in the communities is, is a joy and a privilege. And it's an amazing and diverse county with, with so many different facets and so many uh, differences, you know, from Banbury to uh, the Cotswolds to Henley on Thames to South Oxfordshire, and some very, uh, you know, uh, um, big industries as well in and among. It's a really interesting place to be. You're obviously joining us. You'll come in the new year. Uh, just as probably the country is be- and the church is beginning to emerge from the COVID pandemic, what are the, some of the things that you've seen and learned through this pandemic that you bring to us? Well, well, both for me personally and I think for the wider churches, I mean, it's been a challenging nine months or so since the pandemic struck, but also a learning experience. The creativity of churches moving online, um, doing worship in a fresh way when we're not being able to be physically together for much of the time, but still meeting as the body of Christ. And some of that creativity, I think we need to carry forward and take with us the way we've managed to perhaps um, involve folks who were housebound for some years before, not able to get to church, of course, in the last season, the last six, seven, eight months, have actually been able to take part on the same basis as the rest of the body of Christ. So so not to lose all of those aspects. Um, That said, personally, I I miss being able to sing as part of worship corporately, as part of a congregation gathered. So I'm, I'm looking and praying for the day. And now with this wonderful news, Oxford taking the lead, of course, with the vaccine coming, um, and we trust by the spring, the rollout of that will mean that we can get back to much more approaching normal worshipping life, but not losing some of the special times and perhaps the slower pace of life that many of us have been able to experience in part during lockdown. To hold some of that discipline will be something to try and hold on to going forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have to say, um, the clergy and parishes across um, uh, Oxfordshire and Berkshire and Buckinghamshire uh, through this pandemic has been one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen in terms of the quality of ministry uh, and service service that's been offered uh, to our wider community has been hugely humbling to see. You'll arrive, of course, at a time when clergy and congregations are emerging, but but also tired, uh, I think, uh, and many of us are deeply uh, weary. Tell us something of of how you will set about getting to know and care for and love the clergy and churches that 
uh, Erin, you can. Building relationships has to be the starting point and just taking time to get to know folks. But then the privilege I have as a, will have as a bishop, have as a, a, a minister at the moment, and that all of us have as ministers, lay and ordained, is to, to bring the person of Jesus to those that we're working with. And of course, that wonderful invitation of Jesus, that those who are weary and burdened come to him and receive rest. And, and I think that aspect of the gospel message perhaps is a, a word in season in this particular time for us, um, that we look to Jesus and I in the ministry I take on, but those we support and enable, just help them to come close to Jesus and, and lay the burdens to him and receive that rest, the strength of his Holy Spirit and his equipping for us and, and the partnership of working with um, people in enabling us together to grow closer to God is what keeps me uh, on fire in ministry. Brilliant, thank you. And, and, and how have you learned to watch over yourself and pace yourself uh, in new ministries and times of transition? Um, well, times of transition, I suppose on an ongoing basis, to, I try and have the discipline of a balance between um, regular prayer life and, and my pattern of prayer, but also physical space as well. Um, the trouble with ministry nowadays is it never stops. Um, since the internet's taken over and now in these last nine months with, with the virtual world, it's very easy for one week and one day and one week to drift into the next and not have those times and seasons of space. And so the regular retreat time, which is probably an aspect I'm, I'm less strong on, but equally on, on a weekly basis, um, times of exercise, times of just getting out into the outside world. For me, it, it's been cycling, it's also jogging and, and, and running at a fairly slow pace is the thing I try and do two or three times a week um, as time just to clear my head and hopefully a physical benefit, but therefore of, um, some spiritual benefit as well. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, uh, just, just to give you advance warning, I think the question I was asked most in my first year as bishop in Oxford was, um, uh, do you take your day off? Uh, people were very good at asking me the question. And when I said yes, they said, no, really, do you take your day off? Uh, uh, it was a very important thing uh, that um, uh, uh, as senior clergy, we kind of model uh, what we're hoping that other people will do. And um, one of the things I know you're passionate about is, is sharing faith and helping um, to grow new congregations. I remember you talked uh, when we first met uh, about uh, the way uh, as an archdeacon, you still find time uh, to lead Alpha courses, which I think is really significant. Tell us something about that side of you and the passion that you're bringing to sharing faith. Yes, um, I've been privileged to be involved with Alpha for 25, 30 years now. My, my sending church is one of the very earliest churches in London to, to be involved with Alpha. Um, so that's been a, a, a part of my um, discipleship journey. Um, as an archdeacon, I've not been able to do it as much as I would like, but um, two different churches, actually one in the, the south of my archdeaconry and one in the north, um, I've been able to be involved in their Alpha courses over the years. And that's um, been of a very wide range of churches, actually evangelical and uh, far more Anglo-Catholic traditional. And it doesn't have to be Alpha, um, Emmaus, any, any of the uh, Exploring Christianity courses of just taking time to give people space to think through the questions for themselves, um, to ask any question they want in a way that will, will be respected and have time to talk through. And the joy of seeing people growing to faith, coming to that commitment and stepping forward. As an archdeacon, um, a lot of the role has been problem solving and very practical aspects of ministry, which is vital. And I've, I've loved doing that. Um, but one of the, the things that thrills me about the prospect of moving now into an Episcopal role is, is that side through particularly confirmations of standing alongside people at a moment when they, they make a public declaration that they're taking the faith seriously, they've committed to Jesus and wanting to grow with them. And then that particular privilege a bishop has of laying hands when coronavirus allows us to lay on hands, but to pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit on someone. Um, that, that's a joy that I'm, I'm looking forward to and um, can only imagine the privilege that that will be. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, it is an enormous uh, privilege and, um, uh, and we're, we're just doing at the moment actually a, a series of uh, webinars on rebuilding our ministry with, uh, uh, in terms of adult formation and sharing faith and also with children, young people and families. Uh, and you will, of course, have a huge number of church schools in your Episcopal uh, area. Um, uh, tell us something of your engagement with 
those ministries with children and young people and families over the years? Well, in, in the most recent years, it's been more on the structural side. I, I've um, been a well, previously chairman, currently a trustee of the um, Diocesan Multi Academy Trust for Portsmouth and Winchester Diocese. Um, and through that, and, and then previously in Paris, through foundation governor roles of working with schools. Um, and then just the responsibility we have that sadly many of our churches have very few children and young people, some particularly rural churches. Um, just one or two, if at all. And yet at the same time, often in that same village, there will be several hundred children worshipping daily in collective worship through our church schools. Um, and that aspect of ministry, teaching the next generations to know Jesus, not just teach them about faith, but introducing them, helping them to, to come to know God's love in their lives is, is a privilege and a key ministry of the church. And so to work with our schools, our teaching staff and the wider school communities is, uh, is one of the key planks of ministry. And the fact that the Diocese of Oxford has so many church schools, I think proportionally one of the highest of any diocese in the country, um, again, a privilege and, and a joy. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Uh, and they are, uh, our church schools hugely receptive to to closer partnerships and to continually reimagining uh, the relationship. Again, lots of very creative uh, engagement between churches and schools, even through the the pandemic, which has been really uh, thrilling to see. Uh, and of course, you're coming to an area from an area which is deeply rural, and to an area which is uh, also very rural. And it's not the easiest of times to be a part of the rural church uh, and you'll have the responsibility as Bishop of Dorchester of, of being our lead for engagement in with the rural communities uh, across uh, the whole diocese really. So so what will you bring, what insights will you bring into the rural church and for the rural church? Well I, I think there's a, a particular privileged place that the rural church has. My, my current patch ha um, has a huge rural swathe in the north of the patch, but also has um, suburban fairum and very urban Gosport. And I think the contrast, as I reflect on those different areas, I'm often struck that in the rural areas, the church is still owned by the whole community. Um, virtually the entire village population will look to it as their church in a way that just isn't the case in urban and city and, and even suburban um, places now in 21st century Britain. Um, many of them may not come on a weekly basis, but actually that's their church when it comes to weddings, funerals, um, and Christmas and other events. And so the privileged opportunity we have of being the heart of community life, in, in many villages, the church may now be one of the very few or even the only public building that's still open as uh, pubs and GP surgeries and other, other um, buildings, other facilities have withdrawn from the village areas. And so that gives us, yes, huge challenges and logistical and financial problems with big listed buildings and maintenance um, responsibilities. But actually it means we're ideally placed where the Church of England literally a presence in every community and a physical presence. And of course the church isn't the people, it's, it isn't the building, it's the people, it's the communities that make them up. But actually for our church buildings to be that visible focal point, speaking of God's presence at the heart of the communities and a gathering place. And uh, one of the great things, um, I know Bishop Colin has made a, a hallmark of his last 20 years in post and that I will benefit hugely from, from um, um, inheriting as I take on the mantle from him is um, working to enable many of our rural churches to have facilities in them and proper heating, proper lighting, comfortable seating, um, a kitchenette to provide coffee, um, toilet facilities, simple things that enable those churches to be places of welcome and places of flexible community use, never losing sight of the worshipping purpose at the heart of it, but coming, building from that worshipping centre to be community hubs um, in a wonderful way. And so building on that work that Richard Collin has been doing and, and many others with him these last um, years um, and taking that forward, there are challenges for our rural churches as indeed for our town and uh, city churches going forward but also a huge place of opportunity at the heart of that. That's, that's fantastic. One of the things that was said um, to me most often in listening, prepare, preparing to make the appointment was, um, we need a Bishop of Dorchester who really understands rural communities and rural churches. So I, I think what you've said there will be enormously encouraging to the many, many people uh, who said that. Uh, and the other significant common thing across the county is the growth of new housing and the numbers of people who are moving in, both quite large areas as in Bicester expansion of existing communities, 
uh, and also pockets of housing being built just about everywhere, as far as I can see. Um, uh, you've clearly had some experience also of working with birthing new congregations and new communities for new housing areas. Just again, say a bit about your experience there. Um, yes, thank you. Um, both where I am now and then also in, in previous parishes as well. As you say, every village, every town has multiple houses and, and it, it may only be 20 or 30, but in a population of five or 600, that's a significant impact. And then on top of that, the entire new towns that we see where I live at the moment, a town of um, 18,000 people is, is due to be built two miles north of where we live at the moment. And that's been in the planning stages. Um, one of the learning lessons we've had in working with the developers there is uh, the importance for the church to be there right from, in fact, before day one, um, to be planning ahead and to have, ideally, um, if possible, the appropriate building. It may be a church, it may actually be a community building or multi-use building right from the start of where that new community is built. Ideally as well, if resources permit, um, to put personnel in there. So a minister or a community worker or a church army evangelist, whatever may be appropriate in that context, but as part of the first wave of people that move into that new community. Um, research has shown that in the first 18 months of people moving into a new, new area, that's when they're eager, most eager to build community, to build those relationships. And so if the church can be at the heart of that right from day one, welcoming, um, introducing people to the area, if it's a brand new town context, setting up and helping to set up that pioneer community, possibly to start with meeting in a home or a local school before eventually the buildings um, open. I hope that one of the things we'll be able to do before I move from the Archdeacon of the Mion is to dedicate um, our newest church building, which is um, the relatively new town of Whiteley now. The town's been there for about 15, 20 years, um, has doubled in size in the last two years and currently. And as part of that doubling, we've been able to build a new church school with a dedicated permanent chapel space for the Whiteley Church to meet in um, as part of it. That's a building site at the moment, but um, I hope to be able to be there um, as the Bishop of Portsmouth dedicates that sometime in the spring next year. I might have to be driving back from uh, Dorchester for it, but um, th that will be a joy to see a, a Christian community that's been meeting in a community centre for the last 20 years, now finally having their own visible place of ownership and belonging, not for their benefit, but as a place from which to witness to and serve that, that particular town. And that's a model that I'd love to see replicated. Fantastic, that's really, really good. Uh, uh, and one of the features of church life uh, across Oxfordshire, and indeed the whole diocese, are the number of really close partnerships between uh, the church and uh, the wider community in local authorities, in charities, other churches, other, other faith communities. Uh, tell us about your commitment to that way of working as well. Um, we are part of the community and, and at the heart of it, but with, with our partners in that, both, both um, civic authorities and other faith groups. Um, one of the bodies I've been involved with for the last four or five years now is the, the County Council Organised Local Resilience Forum and the faith um, uh, committee of that, which has meant working closely with, with Muslim and Hindu and uh, um, Jewish colleagues, as well as County Council partners. And particularly during these last months of pandemic, um, we've been part of a, a initially weekly, but more recently fortnightly, um, Faith Forum update call of supporting each other, discussing together what do the rules allow us to do currently? How can we serve our communities in this? And just that sense of partners of different faiths, but sharing that value of being here to serve our communities, serving those who have faith, those who have no faith, those who have other faiths, but together building community, um, that's been a delight. And um, I was thrilled that in the, um, the Zoom call for my announcement this morning, there were um, faith leaders from other faiths across Oxfordshire represented there. And I, I thank them for, for their welcome to me already. Yeah, no, they were really, really pleased to be there, I think. Um, uh, we have this um, uh, vision as a diocese of being a more Christ-like church for the sake of God's world. And you're coming, I know, very much uh, in tune with that vision. Uh, we want to be more contemplative, more compassionate, uh, and more courageous. Um, which of those three qualities are you thinking about most at this moment in time as you, as you make this journey? Well, the, 
The toughest one for me is more contemplative. By nature, I'm an activist, I'm a doer, um, I'm, I'm quite extrovert in character. And so for me, lockdown and not being able to sing in worship with, with people either side of me has been a real struggle. And so I've had to learn something of the discipline of that contemplative side of keeping my, my spirituality growing when it's been so focused on me in my study or on a Sunday morning, um, frequently services looking at a screen as we are this morning, which for me does not come natural. So I guess this, this last nine months period has been something of a learning experience at times, perhaps a bit of a desert experience, but of course it's through coming through that desert time that, that God speaks to us in a fresh way and a deeper way. Um, so I've got a lot further to go with that, but, but that's, that's the plank of those three that, uh, that challenges me deeply. Yeah, fantastic. Well, that's really wonderful. And uh, Gavin, uh, it's so good to have you uh, uh, almost here, as it were, and we look forward very much to uh, your arrival in February and then beginning uh, to get around the diocese in March. Please know that we will all be praying for you and for Christina and the family as you make this transition. And I wonder if to end this podcast, you would pray for us now uh, as we uh, come to the end. I, I would love to, Bishop Stephen, and thank you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that this is your church, Lord, and here in this special diocese of Oxford, uh, a part of your church, the church universal across the nations of the globe, the church through the ages, that Lord of the church, you continue to be faithful, to bless us with your spirit, to guard us and guide us. And we pray, Lord, in our day, Lord, that we would know your leading, or give us eyes to see where you're calling us to serve our communities. Give us hearts that are full of the gospel, of the love of Christ, that gives us strength, that enables us to strengthen those around us. And Lord, above all, give us the joy of Christ, that abundant life that Jesus promises. May that be a daily reality in good times and in struggles. And Lord, in the uncertainties of this ongoing coronavirus situation, Lord, I pray that we would see your light. Thank you for the, the uh, tremendous news of vaccines and the promise that they hold. Lord, we pray your blessing on those, particularly those in our diocese, working on that vital project. And Lord, be with all those who form part of this community, of these three counties of Oxford Diocese. Lord, bless us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Kevin, thank you so much. And uh, we look forward so much to you coming to be part of this extraordinary family, which is the Diocese of Oxford. Thank you. It is an extraordinary family. And thank you for your welcome and your invitation to us. Thank you.